Hello, and good morning, good afternoon, good evening. Good evening. I am Tony Trulove, and I will be your moderator for today's webcast. Welcome to the fourth webinar in our Engage the Expert series. And the, the series will give you more insight into diesel cylinder deactivation, and uh, CBA is the key to achieving future diesel emissions regulations. Each webinar will delve into various aspects of cylinder deactivation, or CDA for short. You'll hear that acronym today. And our experts will be available to take your questions. So feel free to send us questions as you're listening to the presentations. This week's webinar is titled Understanding Diesel Cylinder Deactivation, and our experts will discuss how CDA will help maximize fuel economy manage after treatment temperature, and improve overall engine efficiency. Today's uh, presentation is based on an extensive uh, list of publications, over 30 published papers, and in the research, I'm sorry, in the resources area, uh, you can actually download this list of papers. Uh, they're from uh, a variety of technical journals uh, from SAE, Journal of International Powertrain, um, but we wanted to be able to share all of this great research with you. Um, you can go out to those uh, individual uh, publications and uh, purchase the papers if you would like. Now I'd like to introduce you to our panel of experts. We're gonna start off with Dr. Diraj Dasala, and Diraj is a research engineer at Cummins in the Advanced Systems Performance Group. He works on advanced controls development for next generation spark ignited and diesel engine systems within the electrified commercial vehicle powertrains. Viraj graduated with a PhD from Purdue in 2018 and his doctoral dissertation investigated the potential of diesel engine variable valve actuation, including CDA, achieving fuel, fuel efficient emissions reductions. Viraj. Can you tell us a little bit about the development process behind exploring new variable valve actuation strategies in your PhD dissertation? Thank you, Tony, and good morning, everyone. As you just described, the dissertation was basically aimed at improving the fuel efficiency and after treatment thermal management of diesel engines with variable valve actuation. So we started off with the thermodynamic analysis of the air and fuel which goes into the cylinder, undergoes the four strokes of the engine cycle, and then gets exhausted. And the energy balance, are basically looking at what's happening to the energy that the fuel is being injected into, where all it is going, and where it's being lost. Basically trying to understand what can be done with variable valve actuation to make the pumping loop and the general thermodynamic cycle more efficient and to increase the exhaust gas enthalpy. The premise of my research being that not all cylinders of an engine need to behave the same way or need to have the same boundary conditions to achieve good or favorable combustion. Uh, and also, my research was not about trying to find one solution, but really a series of different VVA-enabled solutions that can try to achieve the same goal uh, so that it presents a range of strategies that can be achieved. Uh, so. Once we found such strategies, we ran experiments, which led to new hypotheses, which further drove experiments. And it was this cycle that my uh, research proceeded. And I'd like to specifically thank our industrial partners, Eaton and, and Cummins, where I'm currently employed, uh, and because they specifically helped us uh, ask the right questions to answer, and that is, uh, that is what we ended up doing. So I'm looking forward to today's keynote presentation uh, by Professor Shaver and the guest talk by uh, Professor Grohl. Thanks, Tony. Great. Great. Thanks, Tiraj. Next up is Dr. Cody Allen. And Cody is an assistant professor at the University of Illinois in the Department of Agricultural and Biological Engineering. His research focuses on creating cleaner, more efficient heavy-duty vehicles by exploring advanced powertrain technologies and architectures. Prior to joining the faculty at University of Illinois, Cody worked as guidance, navigation, and control engineer for Boeing, and he received his PhD in mechanical engineering from Purdue in 2019, and his uh, MSME from Purdue in 2016, and a BSME with high honors from University of Illinois in 2014. Cody, 
Welcome. And what are your takeaways from the exploration of CDA and variable valve actuation from your time at Purdue? Thanks, Tony. Uh, well, yeah, we studied multiple variable valve actuation or VVA technology, not only cylinder deactivation. Uh, and VVA technologies really require a systems approach, like a lot of things in engines, but particularly because the gas exchange system affects not only the engine, but the after treatment so much. I suppose the overarching takeaway with BVA technologies can be simplified by you may be thinking about those classic trade-off curves in engine systems, you know, your NOx PM, NOx efficiency, efficiency thermal management, those, those trade-offs. Many BVA technologies, they, they allow you to traverse those trade-off curves farther than otherwise possible, and, and that can be really useful. Uh, but there are also a few VVA technologies, and, and CDA is one of them, that allow you to shift the entire trade-off curve in, in a positive direction, and, and that's what's uh, potentially very impactful. Great. And uh, next up uh, of our panelists is Dr. Uh, Jim McCarthy, and Jim is the Chief Engineer for Vehicle Technologies and Innovation at Eaton. Uh, prior to joining Eaton, Jim worked at uh, Detroit Diesel, and he focuses on product innovation and growth to develop solutions for engine technologies to conserve fossil fuels and reduce emissions. Jim also holds a PhD and a master's and a bachelor's of mechanical engineering from Purdue. So we've got a whole staff of Boilermakers today. So uh, Jim, why don't you tell us about, um, in your opinion, what are the main drivers for exploring VVA and combustion optimization at Purdue. Thanks, Tony. This was certainly an exciting collaboration where we teamed up with Purdue and Cummins for about seven years. And the camless valve train on the engine at Purdue was a key research lever such that we could determine the merits of variable valve actuation on state-of-the-art engine and aft treatment systems. And it turned out that the main driver for working at Purdue was the research team itself. They proved very capable and valuable to assess the merits of VVA and combustion optimization. We certainly had a team approach in our collaboration with the Purdue students and Cummins, which made this project very enjoyable for me. Additionally, working with the graduate students and watching them develop was very, very rewarding. And you can see we got some great experts, uh, D. Raj and Cody, on the, on the line today as they enter their new career. Uh, cylinder deactivation proved to be a significant technology for saving fuel and increasing SCR callus temperatures for improved NOx reduction. And I'm really looking forward to Greg's talk today. Thanks, Tony. Sure, Jim. And that's a great segue to our special guest speaker, Dr. Eckhard Grohl. Um, Dr. Grohl is the head of the School of Mechanical Engineering at Purdue. Um, he received his uh, diploma in mechanical engineering from the University of Ruhr. And he has been um, widely seen as uh, an industry expert in uh, thermodynamics and uh, advanced energy conversion. He is the principal investigator or co-principal investigator on more than 120 research grants with more than 40 additional grants from various governmental agencies and 30 different industrial sponsors. He has co-authored more than authored or co-authored more than 370 journal articles. Uh, he serves as the regional editor of the Americas for the International Journal of Refrigeration and as a fellow of the American Society of Heating, Refrigeration, and Air Conditioning Engineers. Welcome, Dr. Grohl. And if you would take the next uh, little bit of time here to talk to us about the uh, the program that you've got at uh, at Purdue. Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the introduction. Uh, thank you very much uh, for being a part of this panel of Boilermakers. Uh, this is uh, really, uh, uh, some of them former Boilermakers. This is uh, truly exciting, and I uh, greatly uh, appreciate it. Um, I would like to talk a little bit about uh, the School of Mechanical Engineering and uh, Purdue overall. Uh, have uh, prepared a, a few slides of how we engage uh, with industry and uh, what uh, we may bring uh, to the table in our various interactions. So uh, I certainly uh, like to combine the best of industry with the best of academia. Uh, if you can go to the uh, next slide, please. Um, so uh, we have a large program. In fact, by major, 
Uh, we are the largest program on the on the Purdue campus in mechanical engineering. We have uh, close to 1,500 undergraduate students in our program. Uh, ECE, Electrical and Computer Engineering, as a school, uh, as a department, is larger, uh, but they're offering a two-degree program, one in uh, electrical and one in computer, and so that's uh, uh, by by single major, uh, we certainly uh, have them beat. Um, so uh, of our undergrads, of these uh, 1,500 students that I mentioned, uh, more than 97 uh, percent uh, graduate with at least one industrial experience. Um, we do uh, uh, keep track of that via our senior exit interview when they graduate. And so they have at least one internship uh, or they have participated in our co-op program, which of course is uh, quite powerful. Uh, we can, uh, you, as a student, they can have up to five work sessions as part of the co-op. Uh, or they have done uh, some type of industrial research um, with us, uh, with a faculty member on an industrial sponsored project uh, here at Purdue during the summer or during the semester. Uh, also of uh, of our graduates, and we're graduating nowadays like close to uh, uh, to about uh, 400 students per year. 75% uh, of those uh, go and work in industry. And as you can imagine, as a mechanical engineering uh, program, that goes uh, all over the place, right? Any, uh, we're serving uh, any industry, really, uh, some are listed here as examples. Uh, there are uh, many more. Um, you may wonder what happens to the, uh, to the others. Uh, about 20% go to graduate school, right, after finishing the bachelor. And then the remaining 5% uh, typically go into other professions. Um, so we have uh, uh, some of our undergraduates uh, pursuing law degrees or medical degrees or um, uh, pursuing other avenues uh, once they graduate. Uh, if you go to the next slide, please. Uh, so, uh, I would like in this presentation point out a few different ways of how industry really uh, uh, gets uh, engaged in our school here at Purdue. Um, so one aspect is of course working on uh, student projects and uh, flagship program is definitely uh, capstone design which happens in the senior year typically in the last semester when students are at Purdue. And uh, uh, in the last go around, uh, when we offered it, about 28% uh, of all of our student teams were working on industry uh, sponsored projects. Uh, the teams are typically four to six students um, uh, who work uh, for an entire semester on a well defined project. Um, so, uh, uh, but there are other avenues um, to get involved. We, uh, uh, we have uh, uh, our uh, student design team competitions, like uh, for example, uh, the car teams, such as uh, the Formula SAE, Mini Baja, or Electric Grand Prix, which are also very heavily sponsored by uh, uh, by industry. But we have all kinds of other uh, student uh, design competition teams uh, uh, that goes, uh, for example, uh, space exploration is a big issue again. So we have a, a student team working on a moon rover, on a Mars rover, um, a, a rocket team um, that we're supporting out of ME. Uh, we have drone flying. Um, so we have solar car racing. It, uh, it's really a, a broad perspective. Uh, we offer experiences uh, for credit or for pay. We're doing this during the semester and during the summer. Um, so many different. Uh, one easy way to uh, to really engage with us and uh, and kind of get the uh, the pick of which of these various projects or uh, undergraduate students contacts you would like to pursue is to become a corporate partner of our program. We currently have certain partners. It's a relatively new program for us, and we're trying to grow that. And um, you see. Uh, uh, the logos of those that sponsored our uh, senior design project last time, and then the listing of additional partners uh, there um, in text form. 
um, all of that uh, give us a little bit of money to run these various uh, student projects, and I'll be happy to give you more details if you're interested. Uh, another way that we're very heavily interacting with industry is on continuing education. Uh, listed here is our flagship program, which is our online master's program. So if you have bachelor engineers in industry that would like to get uh, uh, father educated, that would like to get a master's degree, uh, we have been doing this uh, for several decades. Right? This starts way back in the 90s. Uh, and uh, we, uh, we currently have close to 200 students in our online master's program. Um, so that's about 26% of all of our graduate students uh, that uh, we, we have enrolled in ME. Uh, the total number is uh, close to 750 uh, graduate students in our school. Uh, we were last year ranked uh, number one online master's program in the mechanical engineering in the country by U.S. News and World Report. Um, uh, our longevity of the program and the, uh, the detail that we are paying to this uh, certainly uh, is well recognized. The instruction is exactly the same as it uh, would be on campus. The courses are the same. The instructors are the same. So that's uh, uh, quite powerful and uh, a web link is given here um, to, uh, to tell you about it. But I would also like to mention we are hosting conferences, we are hosting workshops, we are hosting short courses. Um, so uh, continuing education of the workforce uh, out, uh, is uh, an extremely important aspect for us. Technology transfer is, uh, is very important to us. You could go to the next slide, please. So. Uh, the other aspect, of course, and that's what we're talking today in our panel uh, uh, predominantly about, is research, right? And Purdue overall is, uh, of course, uh, as a top uh, 10 engineering school and a highly ranked overall land-grant university, uh, a powerhouse in all kinds of research, not just in engineering, uh, there's research in the sciences, uh, in agriculture, right, in, uh, in many different aspects uh, of what's happening uh, uh, at Purdue. Overall, uh, we're generating about a half a billion dollars in research funding every year at Purdue University. Uh, in mechanical engineering, uh, we have uh, 90 uh, mechanical engineering faculty. That is the total headcount uh, that we currently have, and they generate uh, approximately uh, $38 million in research funding um, as part of, uh, of the 500 million total for Purdue. So you can see, considering that we have 10 colleges and uh, many, many different departments across uh, Purdue, right, with close to 40 million uh, being uh, just uh, uh, coming out of ME, it's a, uh, it's a significant chunk of the total. Right. Um, so uh, uh, we actually have significantly increased our research expenditures. Uh, over the last four years, we, we saw about a 50% increase. So that's uh, 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 very good for us. And just recently, uh, this uh, in August and September, yeah, uh, we had a really great success with uh, three uh, nationally recognized centers uh, coming to Purdue. Uh, one is actually, uh, that is uh, $8 million uh, per year, but uh, uh, for three years already funded. So the total dollar amount here is actually $24 million from the U.S. Army for energetic materials research coming to Purdue. That is 100% of it coming to Purdue. And then uh, we are uh, part of uh, two NSF uh, ERCs, Engineering Research Centers, uh, where in each case uh, five million dollars are coming uh, to Purdue. One is augmented reality in manufacturing worker education, and the other one is a precision agriculture uh, using the Internet of Things. And uh, both of these NSF tend to have a strong uh, footprint in uh, mechanical engineering, but also involve other entities at Purdue. 
Uh, overall, I mentioned 90 faculty uh, are located uh, uh, in various aspects of uh, mechanical engineering, and I can't give this slide enough uh, enough time, right? Uh, probably, uh, as you can see, lots of areas are listed, but we recently went through an exercise of organizing ourselves a little bit better. Uh, we have on the inner circle our fundamental academic areas, um, that we cover within uh, mechanical engineering that are also educational uh, related uh, for our bachelor degrees, uh, the various courses that we offer organized uh, uh, as part of these areas. On the outer circle or elliptical ellipse, if you want to call it not quite a circle, right, we have our research application areas and uh, it covers the broad spectrum of uh, mechanical engineering. Uh, graduate courses are uh, aligned with these various areas. Faculty are aligned, research labs, research centers are aligned with these areas, and um, uh, it's uh, uh, it's quite uh, quite an operation. Um, if you go to our ME website, you will see uh, detailed uh, projects under all of these areas and the faculty that are working that. Um, so um, my my last slide before we head over to uh, Greg's presentation is uh, there are many ways how you can get involved in uh, ME at Purdue. Right, there's a place for research. Uh, you can uh, work uh, with the faculty and the graduate student individually on a one-off research project, but you can uh, provide uh, uh, cost share to um, uh, governmental funded projects through the Department of Energy, Department of Defense, NASA, and other entities. Um, we have faculty that run small businesses. Uh, they apply for small uh, business innovative research grants, SBIR grants, or STTR grants, and they, uh, uh, they're always looking uh, for cost-sharing partners, for industrial partners to help with those activities. And uh, uh, overall, uh, we have hundreds of corporate partners that engage with us in these various forms. Uh, we are centers, we are individual research projects, uh, we are uh, consulting with uh, the small businesses. And so uh, we are happy to answer any questions at the end of the session. Uh, thank you very much. Thanks, Dr. Grohl. Uh, that was a great look at the ME program at Purdue. and. You know, it's integral uh, in uh, all of the um, webinars that we've done on cylinder deactivation because of the association that, uh, that Eaton has with Purdue. So we appreciate uh, all of your team's work on that. So without further ado, uh, our uh, keynote speaker is Dr. Greg Shaver, and Greg has joined us um, on a previous webinar. Um, Greg is a, a full professor uh, at, uh, at Purdue in the College of Engineering program. Um, a mechanical engineering program. Um, he focuses on creating challenging and interesting, relevant career launching research. And you know, everybody that you've talked to today, uh, and and many that you've seen on previous webinars, uh, have uh, have worked under uh, um, Professor Shaver. So, with uh, with that, Greg, I'm going to turn it over to you and uh, let you walk us through uh, the presentation. Thank you very much, Tony. Um, this is a great honor and a privilege to be able to speak to the work that, uh, um, like, like you indicated, a number of staff, many students, and our industry partners worked on together with us. So I'm going to specifically be dis discussing uh, diesel engine cylinder deactivation and its merits, which, which I think are pretty significant. And in order to, to, to do that, I think it's good to give some context relative to, to some other approaches that valve train flexibility also uh, enables. All this work was done that I'm going to talk about today with uh, enabled by funding from Cummins and Eaton, as well as uh, direct collaboration with engineers uh, at those companies, including Dr. McCarthy, uh, who's on the panel today. Okay, so a big picture. I'm not going to cover all this material on this slide, but if you wanted a, snap, a visual snapshot or a visual-ish snapshot of what we accomplished in our collaboration uh, with, with Eaton and Cummins, this would be one way to look at it. So. In broad strokes, one takeaway message is that variable valve actuation, including cylinder deactivation, can be used to improve diesel engine fuel efficiency and after treatment thermal management. Uh, we can go after just brake thermal efficiency benefits, and you see that summarized in green. We can, we can go after fuel efficient stay hot operation of the after treatment. That's shown here in blue. 
we can go after getting the after treatment hotter faster. That's in red. Um, and you can see how that maps into the different technologies. And at the, the top header here, you can see uh, you know, how, that, how that's affecting those, those functions. For instance, higher temperatures coming out of the engine, lower heat loss, lower airflow as enablers for fuel efficiency stay hot, uh, shown here in blue as one example. Uh, we also looked at kind of, you know, as you are potentially adding um, some capability to the valve train, some additional capability to the valve train, you also want to be thinking about other things you might be able to do to enable simplification to, to other parts of the air handling system. And you can see that over here in the right-hand corner, the two columns. You know, in some cases, uh, we, can, we can go after um, the, the reduction or elimination of the need to elevate exhaust manifold pressure, which can have some very important impl implications uh, in several of the strategies as well that I'll, I'll touch on just a little bit in comparison to CDA could allow us to operate even without high pressure EGR for, for different points of the operating um, operation of, of a diesel engine at and around idle and low load. So, um, okay, here we go. So the presentation focuses is cylinder deactivation or CDA, but I will again draw comparisons to other methods. So all of the experimental work that I'll show today um, and all the experimental work that is in the publications that Tony mentioned earlier, they all came off of this test bed. So this is a six cylinder Cummins uh, engine outfitted with a camless valve actuation system that's modulating the valve profiles in a way that's consistent with what a cam driven variable valve actuation system could do. Uh, and it's, it's very flexible, has more flexibility than actually we, we need in many cases. We can do cylinder to cylinder, cycle to cycle control of the valve profiles. We can do more than one valve opening or closing event per cycle. For the vast majority of what I'll talk about today, we didn't need all that capability. It was, it was nice to have. Uh, and that allowed us to do apples to apples comparisons of specifically what different valve motion, if you will, strategies on one or more cylinders could enable from a, from a fuel efficiency and from an after treatment thermal management and air handling system simplification point of view. So conventional, um, uh, conventional uh, 2010 consistent DOC DPF SCR, you can see that here. And then of course, like a, a laundry list of, of both stock and um, uh, lab grade measurements. Okay, one of the things I wanna talk about specifically is how we can save fuel or continue to save fuel or operate in a fuel efficient way by increasing, uh, elevating the open cycle efficiency. That's not the only way to improve fuel efficiency, but it's, it's very important to try to do while you're also elevating exhaust manifold or exhaust temperatures for thermal management. So just, just big picture, and you'll see CDA affects these things, but also to some other strategies can as well. We can uh, increase open cycle efficiency by reducing the intake to exhaust manifold gas exchange. So one way to do that is to use VVA to lower the per cylinder gas exchange from the intake to exhaust manifold. Uh, CDA is not focused on that, but internal EGR and IBC modulation are examples of ways to do that. Uh, another way to reduce the intake to exhaust manifold gas exchange is to use VVA to decrease the number of cylinders that are exchanging gas from the intake to exhaust manifold. Cylinder deactivation clearly does that, but there's a number of other strategies that do as well, uh, some of which I'll speak to. The other way we can, we can decrease the size of this pumping loop is to be able to operate the engine from a fuel efficiency, from an emissions, uh, and from a thermal management point of view, um, while you know, achieving our goals there while operating with a lower exhaust manifold pressure. So conventional engines today, really all of them, they, they depend on exhaust manifold pressure, not only for thermal management, but also to drive a high pressure EGR. And so we can use VVA to help reduce the back pressure required for thermal management or to drive high pressure EGR. The way that's manifested can be quite a bit different depending on the VVA strategy, but this is another strategy, another way we can work with mother nature uh, to uh, improve open cycle efficiency. So, okay, so cylinder deactivation. You're not gonna see all of our results from the last seven plus years, but some, some highlights, some things that I think that if, if you weren't aware that we've discovered together with our colleagues at Cummins and Eden that are, 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 I think will give you some important takeaways. So a little bit about nomenclature here, you know, conventional operation is six cylinder operation. Uh, when we say three CF, this is three cylinders fired. So three of six cylinders. It doesn't always have to be that these three, but three CF means basically half the cylinders are deactivated, no valve motion and no fuel injection. Four CF is four cylinders fired, two CF is two cylinders fired and so on and so forth. So it, I'm just gonna show mostly results today. 
from this engine at curb idle where the load is 1.3 bar. So clearly, um, if it's not clear, I'll make it try to make it clear now. That this technique and other techniques I'm going to compare CDA to are not just um, available and helpful at only idle. They're generally available and helpful at low loads. And what we mean by low loads depends on the particular VDA technique. For CDA, it's anything below about you know three to four bar BMEP for an on highway engine. For an off highway engine that's that's operating at higher engine speeds to produce more power up near the torque curve, you know you might actually want to operate at higher speed CD up to five to six BMEP. I'll I'll talk about that a little bit later. Um, but but why idle? Well, you know not just for the drive cycles that um, the, the regulators require that we meet emissions regulations too. That's that's one reason. But the reason why idle is so important in those cycles is because it's often where these diesel engines in practice can, can spend a significant amount of time depending on end use application. So I think probably all of the registrants here already know why idle is important. I just wanted to make sure that I pointed that out. So what's going on here? So this, the, the line between the, the blue, uh, the black dot and the red dot, that's conventional operation of this engine. Where we move along that trade off between the blue, the black dot and the red dot by delaying the intake or the uh, fuel injection as well as beginning to squeeze the, the VGT in this case to elevate the exhaust manifold pressure. And we can definitely reach uh, elevated temperatures up to 260 degrees uh, C for this engine at this operating condition, uh, but a fairly significant payment in fuel if you want to think about it that way. If instead we deactivate three cylinders or, or the three cylinders activated, we can reduce the fuel consumption below even our fuel efficient mode during six cylinder operation and achieve temperatures in excess of 200 degrees C, which is where we want the SCR to be. And it's the kind of temperature we want going into the after treatment to be able to dose urea um, without worrying as much about crystallization. We, at this load, we, we could also see some additional benefit of deactivating four cylinders instead of three. So whether or not you've got two cylinders activated or three, these are, it, it's up to you to choose really. And it's, it, you know, from engine to engine, there'll be differences. If your idle speed varies a little bit, you know, you know, maybe you prefer three cylinders fired instead of two cylinders fired. If your idle load's a little bit different, you might prefer one of the, over the other. But really the point here is when you deactivate cylinders, you have, you have some choice on, on which ones you leave activated. In this case, if you want to get to that 260 degree C that you're getting with the conventional strategy, you can get there and still, you know, achieve a significant redu reduction in fuel consumption and CO2 emissions by in this case, uh, running the two, the two CF mode. The other thing I think that's really important to know that I, um, that I want the community to know is that at least when we run this engine, um, you know, which is a relevant to the, to the world engine, let's put it that way, it's an ISD engine, uh, mid-range uh, engine. Um, when we run it with three cylinders activated, we, we not only see the benefits from a fuel efficient, stay warm after treatment point of view, but we also see a fairly significant reduction in both soot and NOx emissions. And really the reason for this is, you know, we reduce airflow through the engine. That reduces our pumping work with CDA. That allows us to put less fuel in the engine for the same load. So we save fuel. The uh, temperature remains elevated because the air-to-fuel ratio is, stays fairly consistent with what we had before. In fact, the air-to-fuel ratio is a little bit lower than the, the, the thermal management, the conventional thermal management mode here. It doesn't drop as much as you might expect. We, we do see a significant reduction in airflow, and that's what affects this reduction in exhaust manifold or exhaust flow on the bottom left of this slide here. But we also see almost as much of a reduction in the fuel flow. So if our air to fuel ratio was 32 before, now it's 27. So we're not, we're not starving the engine of air, nowhere near that. And so we don't run into a soot problem from that point of view. We're also not, uh, we're also operating the engine during CDA at EGR fractions that are very similar to what we were doing during the conventional thermal management mode. So we're still getting the dilution inside the activated cylinders that we were getting across all six cylinders. We're not sacrificing air to fuel ratio, and we're putting a significantly uh, fewer amount of fuel in the engine, about 40% reduction, and we're only operating in three cylinders. So what does that mean? Well, one of the benefits of that uh, is that you can reduce the soot and the NOx coming out of the engine itself uh, significantly. So this is something I, I believe people should should also pay attention to in, in addition to the thermal management and fuel efficiency benefit. Okay, the other thing is, is you know, then this engine, this air handling system, you know, this idle uh, definition, this low, this speed, we're able to see the benefits during three cylinder fired operation CDA without elevating the exhaust manifold pressure at all. You know, so you wouldn't need for this engine 
uh, if you will, squeeze a VGT or use an exhaust throttle. And, and that doesn't mean you wouldn't want that capability on the engine for other operating conditions, but not necessarily having to implement ex elevated exhaust manifold pressure at idle could have some important implications for, um, you know, a million mile engine for it. Okay. So you can also combine uh, three cylinder uh, or two cylinder fired operation CDA with other valve train flexibility. So these are just examples. We have many more in our database and we published extensively on this as well. But if you take this, this uh, blue triangle point here, you see that we can, we can push to higher temperatures and or lower fuel consumption if we, on those activated cylinders, we do late intake valve closure or internal EGR, right? So you see examples of that. And we still keep our NOx and soot coming out of the engine at or below what the con conventional thermal management uh, mode would be. I'm not saying you need CDA plus VVA. What I'm saying is that if you have CDA and you also have VVA, then you can, you, you've, got, you've got more things you can do with mother nature on the engine. And so some of this is not surprising. It's just the extent to which you can do this and, and, and there is merit, there is merit to, do, to doing that, depending on how low you wanna push CO2, how high you wanna push these temperatures. Okay, stepping back, this is highway cruise. So this is uh, 1200 RPM, uh, 7.6 bar. So our goal here is less, uh, is not so much focused on stay warm um, after treatment um, thermal management. This is on, you know, what if you wanna do a transparent to user DPF region? If you need to do that, as it turns out, at and around you know, highway crews, at least for this engine, uh, you may not be able to get the temperature as high as you might prefer, at least with the air handling architecture that's on our, our test article. With the activation, you can, you can get the temperatures well in a, uh, above 500 degrees C. I'm not showing the emissions results here, but this is also without sacrificing the engine out NOx or um, our PM emissions. So CDA has some additional benefits around thermal management, uh, including uh, active DPF regeneration, if you need that. This is higher speed. So this is just one example of higher speed. So this is 2200 RPM on this engine. And you can see in this case, turbine out temperature and BMEP on the left, uh, normalized fuel consumption and BMEP on the right. And the main takeaway from this is that, you know, up to maybe five to five and a half bar BMEP, there can be a benefit of running cylinder deactivation from both a fuel savings and from a, a temperature point of view. Now, you may not nominally need the after treatment to be at 350 to 500 degrees C, but as you're warming it up or having to rewarm it up, if that's what you need to do, this low load high speed operation, having this option to switch back into the, the, the cylinder deactivation mode can be very helpful. And I'm not showing the, the engine out emissions, but again, we're not, we're not sacrificing anything there. Okay, so let's talk a little bit about uh, uh, dynamic cylinder activation. So this is a cartoon here on the left, a fixed uh, three-cylinder fired operation. On the right is a, if you want to say, a torque equivalent uh, version of that uh, using DCA or, or dynamic cylinder activation. So we, we ran this on the engine as well, did extensive work with this, including algorithm development to, it, to enable it. Uh, there's a couple, there's a, a lot of different flavors of this, but one way to think about it is on one end, you could do something that's an alternating pattern. You can see how that's alternating and how this would probably give you a similar torque and airflow through the engine as the fixed CDA method. And then you can also do something that's aperiodic. Um, and it's actually probably not aperiodic. It's a repeating pattern, but it's a very long pattern. So it, it looks aperiodic, but in general, it's, it is, it's periodic. It, it's going to repeat itself at some point. Um, but in any case, you can operate in this, in this way at the same speed at the same curb idle, and again, this is not idle specific, you could do it elsewhere, but here's data at idle from the same test bed that I talked about earlier. And you can see that from a temperature and from an uh, emissions efficiency CO2 point of view, uh, we can do just as well. Uh, we could also do this for the two cylinders fired case, but I'm just showing you the example here on the left. Look at the blue triangle or the blue diamond and the two uh, uh, green triangles here on the left plot. Um, same benefits there and also same or similar benefits from an engine out emissions point of view. So we can get what we were getting before, and so the question comes up, well, why, why would we wanna do this? Well, one, one reason why you might wanna do this, although my instinct is that this won't be necessary uh, for medium and heavy duty uh, diesel engines and, and commercial vehicles, uh, but one reason you might wanna do this is to have more flexibility over where, if you will, the energy content is from a torsional uh, um, oscillation point of view in, in, in the crankshaft, in the drivetrain. So one way to be able to move around these, these peaks where the energy is coming into the, the, the crankshaft is to vary the speed, 
The other is to vary with how many cylinders are fired. And, and actually, Purdue's done some extensive work on this, and so has Southwest Research and Eden, and, and I'm sure others as well. But I have good reason to believe that you know, if you have any resonance issues you need to deal with in your drivetrain, you likely can do that with fixed CDA. But if you want to explore a more flexible, even more flexible way of pushing around, if you will, these resonant peaks, you can do it with dynamic cylinder activation. Here are just two examples of that. So it can be very powerful. Uh, so a comparison to some other techniques, kind of we're in the blue here in the middle, uh, reverse breathing and intake rebreathing. So why am I showing you these? I'm showing you these exa as examples of kind of the thoroughness the students, staff, and our colleagues uh, at, in industry work with us on to not, we're not fixating on one technology. You know, we're not, fi we were not never fixated on cylinder deactivation. It was one method we were looking at, uh, and we knew there were other ways that we could make, the, likely make this engine operate as if it were smaller, less airflow, get temperatures up, improve fuel efficiency. Uh, and, and reverse breathing and intake rebreathing are two examples of that. So here's kind of our anchors. We have our two cylinders fired, our three cylinders fired. This is the plot I've been making you stare at over and over again on purpose because I, I wanted to, to, to stay with you when you leave the, the webinar here. But if instead uh, we reduce the airflow through the engine through what we call fired reverse breathing. So now you have, in this case, as this cartoon shows, two cylinders that are actually pulling the gas that they're going to use as part of the combustion process from the exhaust manifold, combusting in cylinders one and six here, and then pushing that gas instead of out to the exhaust manifold into the intake manifold. So this, as you can imagine, and we didn't need any high-pressure EGR through that circuit at all, at least at idle for this air engine and this air handling system, so on and so forth. Um, it reduces the airflow because you've effectively got four cylinders pulling on the intake manifold gas instead of six. Uh, so we can improve the trade-off between turbine outlet temperature and, 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 and fuel consumption. We can do a little bit better uh, if we use non-fired reverse breathing. Um, that's a method by which you can have some of the cylinders pull the gas directly from the exhaust manifold and not combust. So here it's a little easier to see that basically we've got the job of the high pressure EGR loop instead being done by the cylinders themselves. We're only firing in three of the cylinders. And there's a lot of different combinations of this we looked at. These are just example results. And this non-fired reverse breathing or NFRB is pretty interesting because now you could start to see that it's in the neighborhood of what three cylinder fire operation does. It's a, it is definitely, I would say, a little bit more exotic what you're doing with the valve train but you know there are tier one folks out there like Eaton and others that, that can make valve trains do this. So if there was some reason why CDA didn't make sense, but you like what CDA can do from a thermal management, from efficiency point of view, you do have other options and non-fired reverse breathing is one of them. It also comes with the benefit, at least this engine, this operating condition of not requiring uh, high pressure EGR. Uh, same story around reductions in airflow, driving reductions in it, it normalized exhaust flow. And if we look at the engine out emissions, you know, we, we can do pretty good. These strategies that don't require uh, high pressure EGR can actually, uh, you know, we, we've got some very competitive NOx and, and soot emissions here as well. So that was, a, that was a pleasant outcome as well. Internal EGR. So internal EGR, again, here's our anchors that we like so much for two cylinders and three cylinders fired. Uh, this is where reinduction and, and, and trapping uh, by way of negative valve op overlap, reinduction we're doing by reopening the exhaust valve during the induction stroke. Uh, and of these two, you know, reinduction also fares fairly well. Uh, in, in this space on the left, top left-hand plot, again, CDA is, is favored for sure. Um, but reinduction is another way to keep, get the temperatures up near where we want them to be and, 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 and do so in a fuel-efficient way. And uh, we can do that with valve profiles that are achievable in a diesel engine with a cam-driven system. Uh, these techniques also don't require high-pressure EGR. So again, lots of methods for, for fuel efficient stay warm operation. Uh, not all of them are here together, but all of those that, um, that don't require high pressure EGR are shown here in this, this, this uh, kind of reddish pinkish color. So, and, and everything's competitive on emissions. But you know, again, we really, like, we really like CDA, but it's not the only tool you have in your toolbox if you're using VDA. Okay, so uh, some of the challenges, we extensively looked at you know, what people were saying they were concerned about or potentially concerned about around CDA. I'm not going to talk about all these. I'm just going to talk about a few, and I'll allude to the others. And in fact, some of these were covered in other webinars, and they're all covered in, in publications that Purdue's been a part of, and, and others have been publishing in this space as well. But let me just talk briefly about uh, CDA during transient operation. So really, this is all about, for instance, over a representative drive, drive cycles. The heavy-duty FTP is just one example. 
you know, if, we, if at idle and at low loads we're in CDA, can we meet the torque demand, the torque requirement, the torque expectation as we move out of CDA into conventional six-cylinder operation? The short answer is yes. So at different sections coming out of unloaded idle, curb idle, and motor, uh, motoring idle initial conditions, I'm going to show you results here on the, on the next slide. So if, if we switch immediately, if we're, okay, we got the go signal, aggressive push down to the throttle, let's just switch out of CDA, either four cylinders firing, three cylinders firing, or six. Uh, we, all those lines in this plot on the left lie on top of or under, however you want to think about that, the blue line, which is your, your conventional six-cylinder operation all the time. So, you know, launching, that, you know, launching out of, uh, you know, unloaded curb idle during the FTP, which is pretty aggressive, there's, there's no, you don't sacrifice the torque response at all, even though you're running CDA at low loads. Uh, if you launch, the, there's a, another kind of aggressive acceleration out of, of, of loaded idle, and it's the same story. That's what these lines say. The fact that they're all on top of each other, that, that's what it's indicating. Uh, motoring, where we're operating, say, around you know, 1,800 to 2,200 RPM, you can see in this case that when we start in CDA, again, the the, the green, the red, and the, and the light blue on the plot to the right, relative to the six-cylinder operations, six-cylinder, we are a little slower, right? So this, if this is an issue, then that might mean you don't operate CDA at, at high speed, or it, it could be this is just one of the things uh, in your trade-off to enable the benefits of, of probably really any low airflow strategy, not just CDA, at, at, at a high-speed operation. So to me, I think that you know, this is probably not an issue, but, but if it is, then, then don't use the strategy there. But at the, the lower loads and at and around idle, we haven't seen any issue as far as the transient torque response of the engine. Okay, so the next slide shows, okay, well, what if we, instead of switching totally out of CDA at the beginning of the, the acceleration go signal, we do it along the way. So, you know, if you want to operate two cylinders fired or three cylinders fired up to, four cylinders fired up to a certain bar BMEP where you want to continue to operate beyond idle, you also see hardly any difference between that and what you'd, you'd see if you were in six-cylinder operation, both when you're launching from unloaded idle or, or uh, loaded idle. And so that's, that's a very good outcome. Uh, other things I won't talk about today, we did an extensive oil accumulation study, charge trapping strategies, uh, charge trapping studies, and uh, vibration studies in CDA. And both at Purdue and, and, and others have also uh, published in this area, uh, you know, the, the vibration with CDA, NDH-related um, potential concerns. That was covered in one of the previous webinars, uh, and there's publications out around that. So uh, big picture, this is a takeaway. If you want to dig into any of these at, with me at any point, you know, reach out. We have publications that, that, that cover all of this. I mean, everything we did in our partnership with Eaton and, and, and Cummins is, is now out in the public domain or will be soon. Uh, and, and so um, we hope that's helpful uh, uh, to you. Okay, so what would I suggest? I'm not suggesting that you, uh, you deploy all these VVA strategies, VV enabled strategies listed on the left here, uh, you know, on an engine. But, but where do I think that they, they have merit? So there's quite a few for fuel efficient stay warm operation that have merit and that I, I, would, I would encourage you to consider. Of them, uh, you know, I'm most enthusiastic about cylinder deactivation, but if there's reasons by which you want to consider other VVA-enabled strategies, that, that's, that's, that's cool too, if you will. And some of these techniques, like cylinder deactivation, you can combine in the activated cylinders with things like IVC modulation and, and internal EGR if you need to do so, if you want to do that. And I, I gave just a couple of brief examples about that. So... Um, we also looked at a number of different operating re regions, and you can see uh, basically this is kind of a cheat sheet of where we see merit of different techniques that are enabled through valve train flexibility. So uh, the last thing I want to do, last but not least, is just acknowledge this, this Purdue team has just been amazing. Uh, we've got phenomenal technical support. Uh, David uh, earlier on and Ryan currently, uh, project management help by partner and colleague, uh, Dr. Eric Holloway has been fantastic allowed me to focus more on the technology and on mentoring technically the, the students, and he kept us more than organized and made sure I didn't sign up for too many things and kept us on task, and he has a strong technical background too. So really, a dream team up here on the top to enable this dream team down here. A lot of interaction with our industry partners, including Dr. McCarthy as well, 
all of these students worked at some point that I'm listing down, I'm showing down below, at some point during, in particularly the last seven years, last eight years of uh, collaboration with Eaton and Cummins on this project, all, of, all but one of them is graduating, and Shreda will graduate in the next couple of years of the PhD. About half to two-thirds of them did get the PhD, um, and many of them are at partner companies, uh, and, and, and uh, Professor Cody Allen, which you'll hear from a little bit today and more next week in the webinar, uh, he just joined the faculty at the University of Illinois. Uh, here's Dr. Gosala, who you'll also hear from. So great team. This is a big part of my job is, is giving students that are fired up about the, these sorts of topics a chance to, to learn and, and accomplish things, not just for learning, but that, that affect the real world while they're at Purdue and really launch their careers. And, and, and this is a great group of people and now they're out in the quote unquote real world, uh, except for Cody and I. Uh, everyone else is out in the real world continuing to, to do good work, much of it um, re related to what we, we're talking about today. So with that, I'd like to thank you very much. And um, I, I'm looking forward to the Q&A. Thanks, Greg. That was um, an awesome presentation and summary of what I know was a ton of research um, that the uh, team has done there. So. Um, Now's your chance to uh, to engage with our experts. Several of you have uh, sent in questions, and we will get to as many of them as we can. Um, so why don't we uh, why don't we jump into the uh, into the Q and A? So, um, Greg, let's uh, let's start with um, this one here. So, how are your results applicable to next generation after treatment systems? Yeah, I'm happy to take that one. So there's a lot of exciting work that's been done and is still going on on the after treatment side. Um, you know, that advancing technology uh, in general still it requires that you know you get to temperature for urea injection for the operation of the catalyst, and so it's compatible. I would say it's and it's complementary. It's it's not that you need that advanced technology for CDA as an example to be something worthwhile to do. CDA is worthwhile to do anyway. Uh, those after treatment technologies are worthwhile to, to implement anyway. Um, their combination is likely gonna be required to meet some of the aggressive uh, regulations that are upcoming. Uh, so, and they are compatible, you know. So for instance, uh, close coupled, um, you know, SCR catalyst, we still wanna get it warm and keep it warm. And if, we're, if, if that's closer to the engine, that's gonna help us as is these low airflow strategies like CDA. So very compatible. And all of the results I showed today were not specific to a particular after treatment system. You, you might, if you, if you take, take a step back, all the results I showed around temperatures were the temperatures coming out of the engine that would be going into whatever the after treatment system is. So uh, thank you for the question. Sure. We've got a couple on noise and I think uh, Cody, you might be our, our noise expert here. So. Um, can you, um, so it's kind of a two-part question. So did CDA alternate, I'm sorry, did CDA alter the sound of the engine? And if so, how? And then can you comment on the effect of three-cylinder firing and two-cylinder firing on uh, the combustion noise level? So kind of noise questions. Yes, I, I, I'd be happy. That, those are interesting questions. Uh, I'll start by saying, you know, anecdotally, at idle, I knew when the engine, or we knew when the engine was in CDA or not in CDA mode. It's not better or worse. It's just, it's just different. When you're at higher speeds, it's less apparent, um, right? When you're at idle, you're getting into a frequency range when you cut, say, half your cylinders that you never were into before. So there is a noticeable change in frequency. Now, again, not necessarily worse or better, just different. Uh, the engine tended to be quieter, especially in two-cylinder firing mode. Uh, the noise from the combustion increases, but the overall sound of the engine is quieter. You know, at idle, your, your valve train is a large contributor to the acoustic content uh, at low loads, especially. So removing, you know, uh, half of your events is, is noticeable. Um, and, and there's actually a, a pretty good portion of my dissertation that uh, speaks to some idle analysis of vibrations and uh, acoustic, psychoacoustics particularly. Great. Um, Diraj, how about uh, you take this one? With regards to transient response of the engine, why is higher speed transient acceleration worse than lower speed operation 
especially when you consider the boost system dynamics operating at higher speeds versus lower speeds. Uh, thanks, Tony. Yes, I can. Uh, that's a very interesting question. So uh, the transient response boost plays a pretty important role in how the transient system works. And if you keep in mind what we're really seeing, uh, thanks for changing the slide. What we're really seeing in the slide is the comparison between what CDA does and what regular six-cylinder operation does. So specifically to answer why higher speed seems to make things worse for CDA is that the, 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 the impact of boost on airflow is nonlinear. And if you basically cut the airflow in half, you are losing much more on boost than you would do with six-cylinder operation. So that's specifically the reason why with the particular turbocharger system that we had tested, uh, which is a stock turbo designed for a six-cylinder operation, with that particular system, when we saw transients, we realized that CDA was taking a, bearing a bigger brunt of not having that boost as compared to six-cylinder operation. Okay. Uh, Dr. Grohl, we've got uh, got one here. You did a great job explaining this earlier, but if you could just briefly, you know, kind of recap, how do research programs like this enhance student learning and engagement? Yeah, thank you very much uh, for the question. Uh, from my personal aspect, actually, uh, research that is conducted at the university is at the core graduate student education. Uh, not many people really uh, focus in on that, but uh, uh, right because we want to advance technology, we want to conduct research, we want to get things done. But at the core, by definition, what we're doing is uh, graduate student education. And with that, um, our most valuable product, of course, nobody uh, would like to uh, talk in the educational sense of a human being as a product, but our most valuable contribution to society is uh, the graduates that we produce in uh, 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 through our research, right? These are masters or PhD students that are uh, extremely well educated uh, that will now go out and uh, apply what they learned uh, in their various professions. Uh, Right, we have uh, uh, two great examples here on the panel today. Um, they will advance technology in, in decades to come, and, and that's what, uh, what we're very proud of and, and where we really have a very lasting uh, impact. Great, thanks. Um, Greg, we've got a question here about uh, increased oil consumption. Is there increased oil consumption with CDA? And if so, what risk does that create for the after treatment? So we we did a we've done a several studies um, and published uh, a, a several papers on this, um, and the oil consumption um, it does not appear to me to be a significant issue. Uh, if it if it is, then you know some design some changes to the design of the ring pack may be necessary. I'll be the first to admit that I am not a piston or piston ring pack uh, design expert. That's, that's not my wheelhouse. But we did develop methods and publish them for how to assess, you know, how much oil may be coming inside the cylinder uh, when you deactivated a cylinder for, um, you know, maybe 100 cycles or whatever, and, and what that looked like at different loads, different speeds, and for different periods of time before you, you recharge the cylinder. So, you know, recharging the cylinders is going to be something you need to do. It's a question about how frequently, um, you know, and, and, and we explored that and, and have data in those publications around that. And in addition to maybe recharging the cylinder more frequently if necessary, you know, some changes to the, to the piston ring pack might also be necessary. Um, we didn't explore, it, we didn't test any new ring pack designs or anything like that. I think this would also be a very good question um, for for Dr. McCarthy to speak to, because um, I'm sure he's heard that one from his from his industry colleagues. He might have a more complete answer than me. Thank you. Yeah, thanks, Greg. This was one of our worry beads, and we ran specific tests, and and it was is a great publication a few years ago. But it really showed that for most of the time we could stay in CDA for five or ten minutes at a time. Uh, before leaving CDA, and we came up with a method where we could have a, a fresh recharge or a fired recharge and then go right back into CDA. 
And, and for diesel operation, that's a, a long period of time. And, and we, we did measure the oil coming out of the cylinders after we were deactivated. And we really saw that the risk level on the amount was very small. Now, if you went to 20 minutes, we could see more coming out. But I, I don't see that as a risk item. It was a risk item at one point. And what we saw is after 10 minutes in, in CDA, uh, our, we were the next time we fired uh, the fuel injector, we had combustion immediately. So it's really not a risk item for me anymore. Great. Right. Thanks, Jim. While, uh, while we've got you right here, um, maybe you can take, uh, take this one. So how did Eaton and Cummins help Purdue make sure that the camless valve train that uh, Greg talked about here uh, produced valve profiles that were consistent with cam-based VVA applications? Yeah, that's a real important question there. Most people think of a camless valve train as you can immediately open the valve and close the valve and really get a square valve, valve profile, which is great for breathing. But then valve train engineers have a camshaft and they got to make the valve move with the camshaft. So you have to work on, uh, you know, following that profile so that the valve train doesn't separate from the cam. So what we did is we worked with Greg's team and said, hey, here's realistic valve profiles. Here's aggressive ones. And Greg's team was able to emulate the exact profile precisely with the camless valve train. And that's important. So when we look at results, we can look at, hey, a futuristic valve train, if it's camless, and how does that compare to what people can make today with a cam-based valve train? So what we did for the last few years is just use the realistic valve trains that valve train manufacturers could make such that all the results were very comparable. Thanks for the question. Sure. Yeah, and Tony, there's a there's an example here on the on the on the right of the slot that uh, the slide I just brought up. The other thing we had in the, this lab, this you know the lab grade camo system is uh, direct measurement of the location of the valves, which you you likely wouldn't have in a production viable system. You wouldn't need it, but in our in our research apparatus, the ability to be able to measure exactly where the valve was was as very helpful. That's how we made sure that our you know, our, our lab, our lab grade animal, our camo system was actually doing what we wanted it to do, which was to, to emulate, you know, uh, production viable, you know, diesel cam based VVA uh, strategies. All right, uh, looks like we have time for a few more questions here. Um, one has uh, just come in, uh, Greg, I think you might be uh, best to take this. Um, how does multiple death uh, affect solid deposit formation and ammonia slip in SCR after treatment systems with advanced combustion strategies? Can you, can you repeat the question? Yeah, uh, so how does, sorry, how does multiple death urea injection affect solid deposits um, solid deposit formulation and ammonia slip in SCR after treatment systems. So I'll be the first to admit, and I'm happy to do so, that my area of expertise is not SCR control um, or solid deposit formation. I, what I can say is that I understand that one way to avoid, maybe the primary way to avoid solid deposit formation is to keep the, the gas temperature going into the SCR into which you're injecting the urea you know, above 190 or so degrees C. So I, I know how we can do that. I know how valve train flexibility can be an enabler for allowing you to dose urea more frequently uh, while avoid, likely avoiding this issue. But uh, specifics about the SCR function itself and ammonia slip is outside of my expertise wheelhouse. So I won't try Understood. <laughs> Understood. Apologize. Uh, no, it's okay. okay. Uh, so let's see. Uh, let's let's take two more here. Um, one is about the uh, the controls. So how are the transient controls going in in and out of CDA created? So maybe Diraj, can you take that one? Yes, uh, thank you. So uh, getting CDA to work in uh, in transient operation was not was not a trivial task. Uh, basically, because it involved. Uh, rather, the biggest challenge involved was the coordination between our valve system and the fuel system, which were operating on completely different computers. So we needed to ensure that when we moved from six-cylinder operation to cylinder deactivation and back, 
we had to ensure that we had the right order of events. So we need to ensure that our exhaust intake and fueling were all activated and deactivated at the right times during the transition to ensure that we don't end up with a NOx PM or a hydrocarbon spike. So that was the major challenge. The other thing that we uh, did was we were running off of the base engine controls and we had to make some tweaks to ensure that whatever the, the engine was calibrated for, for base engine operation is not necessarily applicable for CDA. So we used our best guess of uh, steady state operation to create a first iteration for, for transient calibration and then moved ahead with that. So the whole process to get a system that was successfully running in a, in a, in a transient scenario took us almost a year, but I'd say it was definitely worth it. Great, thanks. Cody, uh, here's one for you. Um, so it applies to your learnings at Purdue and how you're applying this in your current role. So what were your learnings from uh, your on-highway um, learnings at Purdue and how can you apply reducing NOx and CO2 to non-road agricultural engines? Yeah, that's an interesting one. I, I've got a smile currently because this is an area that's it, it's right up my alley. So I'll, I'll try not to get long-winded here. Um, you know, from a certification cycle standpoint, the, the non-road transient cycle doesn't have the extended idle periods of the HCFPP, for instance, but there are certainly a lot of opportunities for CDA and, and other VVA technologies to warm up the aft treatment, keep it warm efficiently, or when you're talking about the off-road market, uh, especially when you're talking about next generation aft treatment configurations, you know, make sure the aft treatment components don't get too hot. Um, and VBA can help with that. Uh, VBA can also simplify other parts of, of the system that you, you would like to simplify in these off-road applications. So that's from a certification cycle standpoint. From an in-use standpoint, you know these vehicles, the off-road vehicles have a really wide range of application variation. Um, and so it'll, it'll, the, the advantages will depend, but they, there are advantages that will translate really well to many of those applications. Uh, you know, I was in a combine shelling corn this past weekend, and you know, there's a tractor with a grain cart in the field, and another tractor doing vertical tillage across the road, actually, and I couldn't help but look around and think about the engine operating conditions at those various times and how VVA could fit in. Uh, a lot of off-road applications are high load, but a lot aren't, and there's, there's periods of, of lower load, and there's some big fuel consumption saving opportunities at those times. Uh, there's also some challenges, but, but definitely opportunities. Great. And Greg, you get the uh, pleasure of uh, bringing us home here. So um, many of the strategies shown uh, today in your presentation are, are all at idle operation. Why is that relevant and how do the benefits of strategies translate to other operating conditions? I'm happy to take that one, Tony. I, I spoke to that a little bit in my, my um, presentation, but I'm, I'm happy to, to, to hit it again here. You know, idle is extremely important, um, and, and you know these engines spend a lot of time at idle, and in and, and real world situations, um, the uh, the regulation cycles uh, capture that. You know, some of the new cycles, like the low load cycle uh, that the California Resources Board is rolling out, also capture that. And um, you know, off road vehicles, depending on end use application, can spend a lot of time at idle as well. Uh, so that's one reason to focus on idle, you know, because they, they didn't give me, because you didn't give me four hours to talk today, you only gave me 25 <laughs> minutes. I, I also focused, I wanted to focus on idle because it would be easier to compare, to talk about CDA, but also compare it to other strategies, right, uh, to focus on idle. But in general, you know, at low loads, including idle, we, we, we want the engine to kind of act smaller, you know, and, and CDA is one way to do that. And so, and that's important at idle, but also in general, uh, in, in, you know, worth doing or worth considering doing at, at, at low at low loads, right? So for CDA again, you know, below three to four bar BMEP for the kinds of engine speeds that um, you see on highway, and maybe you know um, loads up to five to six bar BMEP um, for for applications where the engine speed operates at, at higher speeds, right? So as an example, so, and we have published extensively on that. We have, as my, my, my colleague and former student, 
um, Dr. Joshi spoke to last week in, in one of in this webinar series. You know, we we you know those benefits of operating at idle and at other low loads do manifest themselves across real world driving cycles and in and, and regulation cycles. So it's not just about idle, but kind of focusing on idle with the time we had today, I think helped um, us see how why the physics is of CDA as an example is 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 worth taking advantage at low load. And it was um, a little bit less time consuming to also then compare it to other things um, by focusing sure. on idle. Thank you for the question. No, no thanks. I appreciate it. Um, and, and thanks for doing a little bit of my job here by plugging our webinars. So um, that's uh, that's really all the time we have today. I want to thank our panel of experts for sharing their knowledge on diesel cylinder deactivation. I also want to remind you that we have one final webinar coming up, and Dr. Cody Allen will be our featured speaker next week. So please join us uh, next Wednesday at 9 a.m. Eastern. Uh, we will be sending out emails and uh, social media posts uh, to register for that webinar. So be on the look for, look out for those. And I appreciate everyone's time today. Thank you for watching and have a good day. Thank you.